Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 199, Lunch Break Board Games. Some great games you can fit in during your breaks at work. I'm Sean S., your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight we're tackling a question I get asked often, and that's what are some great games you can bring to work to play during your lunch or other break times? After that, we've got a review of a game that's probably a bit much for a lunch break, despite being a Disney licensed game, and that's Smash Up Disney Edition. After that, we've got our usual week in review where both of us attended our first public play event of 2023. Before that, though, let's stop by the front desk and check out the suggestion box. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk, both positive or negative. Before we get to some comments from our fans, we have a correction to make and an apology to offer. Yeah, a few weeks back, we reviewed two escape boxes from Escape Wealth, the House of the Dragon. This one here and the Fort Knox box. These two escape puzzle boxes here from Escape Wealth. And in that review, I noted, or we both noted, that the House of the Dragon had a spelling error on it on the bottom here, technically underneath this panel that you'd have to figure out how to remove on your own, um, which made the puzzle uh, difficult to solve logically. This was a mistake. So what happened was that I, my family, my daughter in particular, ended up solving this puzzle by brute force. She played around with the buttons on the side, basically, until she discovered the proper combination through trial and error. And then we went on to solve the puzzle and get our prize. Now, after that, I went online to try to figure out what's the right way to solve this puzzle. Like, this worked, but obviously there's supposed to be a logical way to figure out which of those buttons to press. And I knew that had to be out there. So there, I found a video. Technically, it was the top hit on Google called Solving the House of the Dragon Puzzle Box by a channel called Puzzle Pieces. Now, at first, I got to say, it was a ton of fun watching the host of that show um, solve this puzzle because they were a pro. They obviously knew what they were doing, and it was fascinating to see just the logic they were using to figure out what to do next. And man, they were doing way quicker than we did. It took us about three days before we got this thing open. But partway through, they discovered a spelling error. One of the words had an extra letter in it. Then a few minutes later, they also noticed a swapped letter that was backwards. Seeing that, I was like, oh, that's what happened. That's why we were stuck. No wonder we weren't able to logic it out and we had to brute force it. Obviously, mine has a spelling error. Why? Th this makes perfect sense. Well, that kind of sucks, but it is what it is. Now, we did notice that one of the errors from that video had been corrected when mm -hmm. Mo sent me a photo and I couldn't figure out what the issue he was having was. Now, I got to say that probably should have been enough of a hint that I should have double checked the other problem. But you know what? I gave it a quick glance. I am not uh, a proficient at Japanese words translated to English nor Japanese words in Japanese. And when I took a look at that part of the puzzle, I'm like, oh, there's a word with an S in it. That's got to be the one with the extra S. And we went on to review these two games. It wasn't until earlier this week that Escape Welt reached out, the publisher, the maker of these puzzles, and asked for pictures of the error that I realized, much to my embarrassment, that my House of the Dragon is perfectly fine. All the words are spelled correctly. Yes, there is a word with an S, but it's supposed to have an S. The error would have been two words with an S. So due to this, I need to take back everything I said about production issues and escape welt and update my review to state the only real problem with these puzzles that I can see is the price point, which, as pointed out in the review, will be justified for some people. I apologize deeply to escape welt for getting this wrong, and in the future I need to take more time verifying what other reviewers say actually matches what I have in front of me. We pride ourselves on thorough review process, but unfortunately these games aren't easy to play through five times or more to discover mm -hmm. all the ins and the outs as they are with board games. We instead relied on a third party and paid the price. Yeah. So at this point, I've already corrected and republished the written review uh, with a note at the top explaining what the error was. Um, we're offering up this correction and apology here on the show in the podcast, and we've taken down the YouTube version of the review. 
at this point, I don't know if we're going to republish that either as a new video or an update or possibly just leave it down and just keep the links up to the written reviews. Again, our deepest apologies to Escape Well for the error and suggesting that their product was flawed in its manufacture. And we're sorry. All right, let's move on to some listener and viewer feedback. Well, up first, a comment on our Aventuria Ship of Stone unboxing from Alex. A pain in the beep to get the editions right. <laughs> the common advice is to get second edition base game plus Arsenal of Heroes plus Ship of Stone second edition which includes Ship of Lost Souls, Forest of No Return, and Ship of Stone. But make sure the seller has the beeping right ones. I did three refunds so far to get them, and no luck. Settled with second edition base game and first edition expansions, and I'm done with it. I, I feel your pain, Alex, but there's obviously been some miscommunication somewhere because what you are trying to purchase does not exist in English in North America. There is no version of Ship of Stone that you're looking for. So the sellers aren't the ones who are at fault here. They're selling you what they have, which is the only thing that's available. Now, the German version of Ship of Stone was this nice big combo box that includes two adventures, Ship of Lost Souls and Forest No Return, and a new adventure that followed those two and bridged them. Now, when localizing the game for North America, for reasons I can't actually answer to because I don't work for Ulysses Spills, they decide to keep Ship of Lost Souls and Forest No Return as separate products. So they're their own individual boxes and then released a new version of Ship of Stone, which you might want to call second edition, but really it's the first printing here in North America, which is a very small single deck expansion that requires you to have the other two. So I don't think you can blame the sellers here because, like I said, they're, they're just selling the product that Ulysses Peel shipped them. There is only one version of Ship of Souls, or sorry, Ship of Stone here in North America. A single deck of cards that requires you to buy both. There's no way to get a combo with all three in one box over here. Organizing, unboxings, reviews, and even talking about them has been tough trying to keep all the little bits straight. True. Now, next up, a longer comment from Phil Hatfield on our topic of board game endings. Board game endings certainly don't have a lot of variety. You have be the first in a race style of game, think Formula D, Lewis, Clark, and it's like, be the last survivor, think Suro, Titan, accomplish a goal and possibly lose trying, think <laughs> Legendary Encounters, Race for the Galaxy, Republic of Rome, etc. Acquire the most points or money, think Acquire, Everdale, Wingspan, or be the first to X points. This is where Catan, Cosmic Encounter, Merchants and Marauders, etc. are. Triggers upon end can be abrupt for things like Survivor, Last Survivor, or Accomplish a Goal, thinking of villainous for the immediate ending once someone achieves their goal. Mm -hmm. Triggers can also lead to even number of turns for everyone, like in Roll Through the Ages. Or triggers can be variable, such as in Everdale, uh, where you only end when you run out of things to do, so everyone can end at different times. On the side topic, at the end of this video, a game ends when the players end it. If the players think a game isn't done until the final tally, then it doesn't end, and I pity those people who play Arboretum and tie in that. <laughs> if the players agree the game is over after two turns, then it's done. It all depends on the players of each game. Or, as an alternative, it ends when the rules say it ends. If a game says that the game ends, and then you calculate your score, scoring is not part of the game per the rules. If the rules say the game ends after you calculate scores, Scoring is part of the game, part of the rules. Personally, though, I think a game ends when the players say it ends. Well, thanks for the detailed comment, Phil. Um, I will say that a game that ends at X points are also races. Uh, I think we made that point during that episode. And I got to say, your list, kind of like ours does, seems to have a mix of win condition, end game triggers, and actual end game mechanics. Um, I think you'll see more of that distinction when you check out our next episode about end game triggers and how those are different than endgame mechanics. Now, I do have a question, though, about when the game ends. What if the players don't agree when the game ends? That's what I want to know. Now, I do think you adding in a point where the game ending early due to people not having fun or whatever, that's a good one. That's a good game end that we didn't include. But that's not one that's included in the game, I would say. Now, another one I noticed when you were going through the list of games there that you mentioned some, some, some games there that I think are definitely... 
Um, like Race for the Galaxy is two X points. It's the first player to reach 15 points. What's your goal in Race for the Galaxy? It's get points. So I don't see how that stands out as different. But I totally get like Battlestar Galactica. The humans either reach the end or the Cylons make them fail was on our list. But again, once you get into goal based, I think you're talking about lots of different things. And again, we're talking triggers, not end game mechanics. Right. And I respectfully, respectfully choose not to fight about this during the suggestion box. <laughs> Now, next, a comment from Ponebeard about uh, probably better known as Matt Jacobs on our Throne of the Thrones of Valeria review, a game Matt designed. Well, thank you so much for the kind words for Thrones of Valeria. I made the game because I wanted a trick taking game that didn't automatically reward winning the most tricks. So it was great to hear you talk about being big fans of traditional tech trick taking and liking my game. Oh, hey, Matt, thanks for not only the comment, but checking out our content about your game. Not all designers do that. Also, thanks for a great game. I will say, if you can impress people in this area with a trick-taking game, you're doing something right. Well, finally, let's finish up with a comment from Gunkatron5000 on our Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade review. I imagine that the 10 cards starting, de uh, starting deck standard with a five card draw may be a design choice for balance of the opening rounds. Having too much variability on the initial opening hands might give players an excessive chance for luck based disadvantages. Even just having a 30 card starting deck with multiples of three of each card and a five draw would result in a far greater potential for imbalance versus a 10 card deck. All right, so thank you for the comment there, Gunkatron. But uh, I think I wasn't as clear as I thought I was when we were doing the review. Now, my complaint is any deck building game, including this one, where the amount of cards in your deck at the start of the game is your hand limit times two. So if you have a six card draw and you have 12 cards just as much as in this game, if you have a five card draw and a 10 card deck, it's a game where you know, as soon as you get your first hand, what the next hand is going to be. There's no surprise. You've now seen all, you've seen five of your cards and can easily deduce what the other five are. Now to fix this, you don't need 30 cards. That's, that's going way above what I'm suggesting here. You don't even need 15 cards. All you need is that hand size times two plus one. That's it. That would be enough to fix this problem for me. So in Cowboy Bebop, give everyone 11th card. And then something else I brought up with the review that I think would help with the asymmetry is if every deck was unique, make that 11 card unique to each character type. That way, when you draw your starting hand, you know what cards are in your next hand could be and most likely will be, but you won't know exactly what you're going to draw for that second hand. Well, that's it for this week's comments. We always love it when you comment on our posts. Email mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Reach out on social media. A quick reminder before we get on with the rest of the show. So next week, we will be recording our 200th podcast episode and we want you to be there to celebrate with us. For the special episode, we will be talking about our top games of all time, spending time interacting with our fans in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch, as well as launching a big 200th episode giveaway. Big's not even a big enough word for how big this giveaway is. Thanks to awesome sponsors like The Op, Japanime Games, Puzzling Pursuits, Unidragon, Grand Gamers Guild, and even Escape Well, who has been very understanding about the error I mentioned earlier. With these awesome companies and the chance of even more joining in this week, this is going to be one of our best giveaways ever. Let's just say it should be epic. Now, Deanna also has some great door prizes set aside in the vault, which we'll be giving away throughout the show. See you all next week, February 1st, starting at 9 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. See ya, Space Cowboy. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we're tackling a question I have been asked a number of times. For example, Emmett O'Brien went over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicked on Ask the Bellhop to ask, I have an at-work board game day coming up on the 10th. I don't have control of this event. Basically, I'm looking for any games I can bring or suggest to be played during 15-minute breaks or one-hour lunches. I've made some suggestions already, hoping to make it likely that games do get played, but do you have any suggestions? Now, we've got a couple other similar questions on our question hat as well, but even just this weekend at our board games at the Barbershop Bar 
Open Game Night, a local gamer, Scott, noted he started playing games during his work breaks, but he's looking for suggestions of games that can be set up, played, and finished in under half an hour. This is also a question I see come up a lot on social media with posts like, Mm -hmm. need some games to bring to work tomorrow, to play during break, go! Definitely see that quite often. Now, I do wonder if any of this has to do with people swapping back to physically going to a workplace again after spending a lot of time at home and getting more into board gaming. Once you start gaming, there's no end. Whatever the reason for it is, we're here to help. So Emmett is looking for 15-minute games, but also one-hour lunch break games. While I know a few people have lunch breaks that are an hour long, you got to remember you also have to fit in eating there, and you don't want to eat while you're playing games. We've talked about that before. Try to separate the gaming with the eating. At least keep the food on a side table away from the games. Now, Scott's looking for half-hour games. And I gotta say, I think the average work break is probably closer to about 20 minutes to half an hour. So what I think we're going to do is we are going to limit it to games that can be played in under half an hour. Now, when talking about half an hour or less games, we're going to include setup, teardown, calculating scores, etc. But this won't include teaching the game. Hopefully, teaching the game is something you only have to do once. Yeah, Scott actually brought up that for his events, whenever he brings a new game, he does a rule teach during first break, and then they actually play the game during the next break, which I got to say is a great way to do it. You may also work somewhere that you can leave a game set up and maybe come in early and have it ready to go throughout the day. And in that case, that's awesome. Maybe Mm -hmm. you can fit in two games during your breaks then. But for this list, we're going to assume that's not the case. Now, when first working on this list, my short list wasn't very short. It had a lot of games on it. Over 50 games I was able to find just from stuff I played and walking around my own game room. Um, So to cut down the list a bit, one of the first things I did was I eliminated any two-player only games. There is a great number of short two-player games. While it's possible people gaming at work only have on, on one other player who's interested in playing with, I think it's more likely to be a larger group of three or more. Plus, most of the games we're going to be calling out today do play fine just with two. They're just not two-player only. Another extra step we did to make this list as useful as possible is eliminating games that you can't easily buy right now. A shocking divergence from our usual lists, I know. Uh, yeah, when I, especially when we were doing the oddball games, when I was trying to find links for our show notes, I'm like, oh, wow, okay. I, I got to remember that the next time I do a game recommendation list, try to recommend games people can, can get because <laughs> we have gotten flack in the past for recommending awesome sounding games, but then people get frustrated because they can't actually find the games to purchase. So this time, absolutely everything on this list is currently available as of January 25th, 2023. Now, Tuesday, when this goes up, so goes live, maybe stuff will have sold out. But as of right now, <laughs> you can buy all these games. As usual, this list is in no particular order. All right, my first game that came to mind when talking about this was Fuse. Fuse is a real-time game that once you have it set up, there's a little bit of setup. You got to sort some dice out and some cards out, shuffle a deck, right? Once you got that going, it takes exactly 10 minutes because you were playing the game on a 10-minute timer. So in a 20-minute lunch break, you can probably fit in two games or sorry, a half hour lunch break. You can probably fit in two games and maybe in a 20 minute as long as you're really quick at setting it up. Now, what happens in this game is real time, you set a timer of 10 minutes. I recommend the official app because it will stress you out because you have this voice talking kind of GLaDOS like about the place about to explode and you roll a bunch of dice and try to place them on cards and you have to stack some dice and it's fast, furious card or sorry, dice drafting, trying to complete cards. If you get through all your cards, you win. If not, the place blows up. It's all about defusing a bomb. Fantastic quick play game that obviously is not going to be for everyone because it's real time, it's cooperative, and it does have a dexterity element. But if those are all okay for you, this is a great one to get yourself pumped up during your break. And that was Fuse. Next up, we've got Tickets Ride New York or any of the other City series. Yep. This is a Ticket to Ride game I actually enjoy. I've never hidden the fact that I'm not a TTR fan, but this one, in large part because of its speed, really hit a sweet spot with a quick 15-minute play featuring all the same gameplay that just doesn't overstay its welcome. So you've got all the greatness, but you can fit possibly two two games of it in mm-hmm. that half-hour lunch break. Yeah, this is a, a simpler two- to four-player version of Ticket to Ride that I think is fantastic. It scratches that itch without taking all night. 
uh, that is Ticket to Ride New York or Amsterdam or San Francisco or London, I think, at this point, if they haven't put out another one. Next, I have Breakdancing Meeple. I decided to start with the timer-based games with dexterity elements, though really not a lot of dexterity here. This is a board game that I think is just something that should have happened years ago that I can't believe it took so long. Um, you literally grab a group of five mini meeple, little wooden meeple, and roll them, hoping they land in specific patterns like on their feet, on their side, or on their head. And you're trying to fill in great dancing move cards. And every time you fill it, you call out the move you just did, and you're going to score some points. You play over three rounds, and there's even a kind of deck building element where you're going to learn new moves between rounds. Really surprisingly deep game for how silly it is another timer game small box easy to throw into your lunch bag and that was breakdancing meeple next up i've got hanabi now while you can't talk about the cards you can still chat during the, this game of hidden information where you don't know what's in your hand but everybody else at the table does mm -hmm. and are trying to give you the best hints so that everyone can complete the game with limited information this is the sort of game you may rarely ever successfully finish, mm. but just getting a little bit closer every time is an exciting and fun achievement that can be played easily in about 20 minutes. Plus, if, Hanabi, if you play it at work, you're going to come up with your own little work-based um, language for communicating clues from each other, which is something I always find fascinating about Hanabi. My next one is another card game, and that is Red 7. Now, Red 7 is a game where at the end of your turn, you must be winning or else you lose, which sounds rather odd. But once you sit down and learn this game, you'll quickly learn it's all about modifying the game rules and playing cards out of your hand to build the tableau. Now, there is a slight problem with this one as a lunch break game. Play multiple rounds of Red 7. Just play until it's the buzzer goes and you have to put it away. There is a full set of scoring rules, which I actually really enjoy, but that makes the game a little too long because you're playing to a set point total. So Red 7 belongs on this list as long as you toss out the full scoring rules and you just play multiple rounds. And trust me, the game's fun enough. Without those rules, you're going to enjoy it either way. Plus, has the ability of having special rules for the odd-numbered cards if you want to toss that in to kind of spice things up once everyone's kind of figured out the base game. There we go. And that was Red 7. Now, next up, we've got either Codenames Regular or Codenames Duet. Team-based, either competitive or cooperative word-guessing game that can also be played just as easily in a casual manner without keeping a score if people need to come and go as you're playing. Play as many rounds as you have time for. It's a fantastically flexible game uh, that allows you to have competitive, cooperative, or open-ended games mm -hmm. uh all just guessing words and trying to uh, avoid the assassins i'm gonna have to point this out because i pointed out every time we mention it code names duet is not a two-player only game it works perfectly fine actually excellently as a multiplayer team experience i personally prefer it to code names at all player counts and that is code names or code names duet or technically you could pick up one of the themed or picture versions as well Next, I have a game that I think already has been called out in the chat room, but people mention this one all the time when talking about quick filler games, and that is No Thanks. This is a game where you get a bunch of chips at the beginning of the game. Someone passes you a card, you either keep it or you have to toss a chip on it and pass it to the next player saying, no thanks, I don't want that one. And the reason you're doing this is you want to have the lowest score possible, which would be having no cards, but good luck with that but you score your lowest possible numbered set. So if you get past a 13, but then you're able to cat, cat, get a 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, you only actually score eight points. That is the trick to no thanks. Uh, There's some awesome streams of people playing this. It is It really is one of the best filler games ever published. And again, being a filler game, perfect for that break. And that was No Thanks, the game, not just for me telling you no. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Sushi Go Party, the improved Sushi Go game with all the fun of the original, but more options to choose from. And with simultaneous actions happening, this game can really move quickly once everyone is familiar with all the different types of cards and they get a strategy in mind. And with Party, unlike the original, you change up the ingredients each game to keep mm -hmm. it fresh as sushi should always be. 
That was Sushi Go Party, which amuses me the most because Sean finally got to try Party and is now recommending this over Sushi Go. Uh, next, I have a very kind of toyetic, kind of big, big plastic game that you can find at your mass market stores. It may not be perfect depending on the size of your break table, but that is Blockus. This is a polyomino placing game where you've got a giant grid and you're placing out polyomino shapes where each shape you place must touch your own shape, but only diagonally. It's all about cutting off sections of the board with the goal being to be the player who plays all of their pieces first. Then everyone else gets points for their leftover pieces if you want to keep an ongoing tally, though I think most likely you're just going to play a single game of Blockus and figure out who won. And that was Blockus. Now, next up I have The Crew. No surprise, finding trick-taking games on our list. And fans of Spades will love this one. This is a co-op, puzzle-based, two-to-five player trick-taking game where every round has a different goal. And when you run out of time, you just remember where you, were, where you left off and start again next break. Now, technically, there are two versions of the crew out there. We have only played the first one. Um, uh, search for Planet Nine? Yeah, uh, Planet X. Planet X? No, that's a different game. Search for Planet X is a is totally it? different game. Yeah. So I think it's Search for Planet Nine. Now it's I two forget. versions of the crew. <laughs> there are two. There's now a Deep Sea Adventures one. We have not tried Deep Sea, so I will recommend the original, uh, the crew, but the other one I've heard is probably pretty good. Mission Deep Sea is the new one, there but we, we can't remember the name of the old one. <laughs> The Quest for Planet Nine. Um, I, that's, I think, what it is. The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine. Sorry about that. Next up, I have New York Slice. This is a pizza game. What better theme for a lunch break? Especially because you could technically play this with actual pizza, but you're going to have to order, I think, six or seven different types. Uh, this is a game that uses the I split, you choose mechanic, which is fascinating, where one player has to divide up a pizza then everyone else gets to draft slices and they get what's left over. So there's a ton of strategy in trying to, you know, make it so that you don't make a pie too juicy and you still want to get what you need. Uh, scoring is based on having sets of different types of pizza, and it introduces an interesting card make mechanic called Today's Special that gives you a special way to score and break the rules. This is a fantastic game with a great theme, great looking tiles, and even the um, the score sheet looks like a, a receipt book, which I just Everything about this game just screams theme. I love the I split you choose mechanic. And I got to say, like for lunchtime games, you're even sticking with the theme of lunch. Here. And that was New York Slice. Next up, we have Drop It. A Connect Four that's actually fun. <laughs> a shape-based, gravity-driven puzzle game that plays different every time. And with two to four player options or team play, mm -hmm. as well as multiple official variants in the game, in the rulebook, there's a lot to love about a lunchtime game of Drop It. Like, do watch out you're not being dropping any food in there. Luckily, it yeah. is washable, though. That, that's kind of disturbing. Yeah, Drop It, we just reviewed this one last week, or the week before. I think it was just last week. So check out our review for how much we actually love Drop It. Spoiler, it's awesome. That's why it's on this list. Um, the best thing I heard about Drop It is someone on Twitter called it uh, chaotic evil Tetris. And I'm like, that might even be better than connect four for gamers. And that was drop it. Next up. I have probably the lightest game on the entire list, but great. If you also want to chat while having your break and complain about your bosses or your work environment and say something other than hardly working, working hard. Um, that is rumble in the dungeon, which also could be rumble in the house. And I think there's also a Cthulhu themed one, though. I don't remember the name of that one. Uh, this is a really simple game where you build a dungeon, you put 10 characters out on there, you randomly are assigned two of those characters, and your goal is to be the last man standing, or last creature standing, or woman standing in that case. Sorry, last last person standing. Last thing or orcs standing. Prisoners? Yeah, or the last thing standing, I guess. I'm like, the last monster, the, the last dungeon denizen remaining. Um, really simple game. You either move a piece or you choose two pieces together, two or more pieces together, and decide which one of them dies. That's pretty much just taught you how to play. There is a little bit more to it with the treasure chest, infinitely replayable, and like I said, super light, so this is a great conversation game that you can just hang out and talk and chat while slowly killing off the other denizens of the dungeon. 
And that was Rumble in the Dungeon or Rumble in the whatever else they've managed to publish <laughs> in that uh, theme. Now, next up, I've got Thrones of Valeria. Now, back to more trick taking, this time with a different twist. The winning suit can change during the hand. And it, mm -hmm. rather than hands won, it's coins earned that make this card game stand out as a two to six player game with team variants as well for those Euchre lovers out there. Now, this one is going to take a little bit of time. Uh, if you are not a trick-taking gamer, you're may, this one may take a little longer. But uh, for trick-taking gamers, once they've uh, had a couple of hands behind them and are used to it, this game will fit right in nicely. Yeah, I will say our first couple of games were a little longer, but once everyone internalized what each of the cards did and got the mechanics down, you can easily complete a game in under half an hour. Next up, one that is another lighter game that is just kind of neat. You might even learn something we were playing, and that is Timelines. Now, I'm not calling out a specific version of Timelines. There are tons of them, and you can mix and match them. This is where you get a hand of cards, one card's put on the table, then the next player has to play another card in timeline order either before or after that. And the next player is going to play a card and do they put it before or after both of those or between them, trying to make a solid timeline where everything is in chronological order. So it's things like, do you know when the space shuttle launch was in comparison to the invention of the bicycle and to comparison when Louis Armstrong was born, for example, just as three random ones, um, including like there's mythical sets as well. So it's not all historically based. A slightly educational game, but this is another one that you can easily chat and half the fun is when you reveal everything and everyone's like, wow, I didn't realize the bicycle was invented before. And I'm not going to throw something out here because I'll just be <laughs> wrong um, I, or whatever. The, the Betty White really is older than sliced bread. I know. I don't know if that was a true fact, but that's at least one I saw on the Internet at once. Um, fun game, super lots of different versions out there you can pick up. And that was Timelines. And next up, I've got the game. Unlike some games, you can talk some during this game. You just can't give out any specific details. Playing with that communication is great fun and makes this seemingly simple game of putting cards in order great fun for one to five players, though three is really the sweet spot for this one. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the game. Deanna and I like to keep this in the van and we play it on date nights or out at restaurants or at a pub or whatever. So I personally enjoy it. Two-player plays grade three. I don't even think there's a problem at five, though you don't get as much of a... Your hand is pretty large, so it becomes much more difficult at the higher player counts. And that is the horribly named The Game, The Game. Next, I have another card game. There's a lot of card games on this list, it seems, because, well, they're small, portable, and tend to be fairly short, and that is Dead Man's Draw. This is a push-your-luck game, and honestly, one of my favorite push-your-luck games I've ever played where you are going to draw a card from a deck and put it face up, then you're going to decide if you draw another card or stop. There are multiple different suits. Each of them do some interesting things in the game because it turns out it's a tableau building game. So you're going to keep drawing cards, but as soon as you draw a single duplicate of the same suit, we'll say, even though they're like anchors, swords, and cannons, you bust and all the cards go away. But at any point you stop, you then collect all the cards and their special abilities go off. Swords let you make other players dis uh, discard cards. Hooks let you steal cards from other players. Treasure chests let you reveal three cards from the deck and then um, decide if you want to keep them or not, and so on. It's it's a really fascinating game where every suit does something different, but the goal is actually to collect the highest number in each suit through this really unique push-your-luck mechanic. This is one that should be on the Sean Should Try It list the next time we've got a big group together, because this is a nice quick one as well. And that was Dead Man's Draw. And next up, we've got Splendor, but this one you're going to want to stick with experienced spent Splendor players and take some time familiarizing people with it before you sit down for some mm -hmm. real games. This one can be a bit rough for newer players unfamiliar with it, but if they can learn it and get comfortable, you can certainly get this game down in 30 minutes or less. This chip collecting tableau building set collection game is a perennial favorite and you can even get it in Marvel form to make it more familiar to players. Supposedly there are some changes to the Marvel edition, but I don't know what they are. I know my wife and daughter can fire off two games in half an hour easily. That is Splendor. Next, we have Yardmaster, which I thought for sure I would delete from this list as not available, but I found it for sale, so it's still out there. This is a train yard set collection game 
where you are going to play sets of cards to collect train cars. The cool part here is you can only connect a new freight car to your growing train line if it matches the color or exact number of the car before it. There are only four different numbers, one, two, three, four, and there are four ones and only one four in each color. There's even some trading involved in this where you can trade in two of a kind for another. Um, this kind of even has a ticket to ride feel the way you're trading in cards. It's got some really neat mechanics where you can collect trains that don't latch onto your train right away because they're wrong and they stay in your yard. But then eventually, if you get a, the right card out, all the stuff in your yard could suddenly combo out and fill up your train. It's a race to a set number of points, uh, which is based on the player count. A great quick game and surprisingly quick enough to fit in under half an hour, even though there is a Yardmaster Express that's even quicker. I personally do recommend Yardmaster over a Yardmaster Express. There's just a little bit more going on, and I find it more enjoyable. Yardmaster Express, instead of buying cards and trading, is drafting. You get a hand of cards, and you pass them, trying to make your train. All right, and that was Yardmaster. Next up, we've got Railroad Inc. Now, the hardest part about Railroad Inc. is figuring out which version to buy or play with. Yes. You roll some dice and draw the results on a small erasable board. Everyone uses the same dice, but comes up with very different results. Mm. Now, one set gets you up to six players, but with more sets, you can add more players. The number of drawing boards is the only limit on this game. I know someone who streamed a hundred player game of Railroad Inc. at one point. That is Railroad Inc. Next, Shikoku. Uh, the race game that does something different. We reviewed this one at the end of last year. This is a game where you are playing cards to move up a temple in Japan where you don't want to be first. It's all about moderation. The player who gets to the top of the temple is eliminated. And you don't want to be too slow because, again, it's about moderation. The player at the bottom is also eliminated. And it's actually the players in the second to first to and second to last players who win this race game. It's got a really neat mechanic for drafting your cards. Um, really simple theme, really quick to teach. People will pick this up after one play and a short play time. Perfect for your breaks. And that was Hikoku. Now next up, I've got Point Salad. Now the first game may go a little slower, but once people are familiar, this is a blindingly fast set collection card game where you're choosing both how and what you score from the same card pool. Mm -hmm. Two to six players of healthy food goodness for your lunchtime. And that was Point Salad. Next, I have Stellar Conflict, another rather unique game. This is a card-driven space battle game um, where you have your army, which once you use the advanced rules, you actually build from a set of cards, and it's all different ships with lasers pointing out different directions as well as some asteroids, and then shields on different sides, and you literally throw these cards down onto the table, and then everyone has a set time limit to put all their cards out. Once that time limit goes off, everyone has to stop, and then you resolve the battle, starting by a ship initiative number, using elastics to figure out what ships hit, hit which, getting points for destroying other ships, as well as stealing cargo from them. It is one of the most unique games I own, and I've got to say this is a good one for excitement level, where you're trying to resolve it, and you're like, oh, I think I got him, I think I got him, and you reach it out. And like I said, the only game I know that uses elastics as a range ruler, which i got to say is brilliant for a line of sight mechanic. Uh, that is that is one of the most unique games that, that um, Stronghold Games has ever published. Um, it's awesome because at Origins, they were giving away coasters at Barley's that was an expansion for this. So I actually have like a boss thing, or it's a space station on the other side. A really unique game. All right. Well, that was Stellar Conflict. Next up, I have Ven. Now, this one may not leave you feeling quite as refreshed when you're done your lunch, yeah. as it can be a bit on the brain burning side, at least as the clue giver. But otherwise, a light, friendly, team based guessing game with an interesting twist about how you're giving the clues using a Venn diagram and some interesting art <laughs> uh, the the number of ways we will say to talk about the art in ven uh you know if this game came out now it would probably have ai generated art 
because it's like a bunch of clip art mashed together that once you play it a few times, you realize are actually tied to the words in the game. So it makes a little more sense and not quite as like, what the heck are all these emojis and cats and rainbows on these cards? That was Ven. Uh, sticking with the op who produced Ven, the next one and my final one for our list tonight is Hughes and Cues. Uh, this one is you get a giant color board that looks like you're in Windows Paint or Photoshop and just went to change your color, showing the entire rainbow of colors. And then the clue giver gets a card with four colors on it. It picks what color they want of those four and then gives a one word clue. All the rest of players place a little clone cone, not clone cone on the board where they think that color is. Then the clue giver looking at their answers now gives a two word clue to hopefully hone things in. Then they reveal what their actual color was, put this little tray thing out and everyone scores points for how close they were, including the person who gave the clue getting points for the people who are closest. Really simple to learn game, really quick to play, engaging enough. And this is one of those games where the actual fun isn't necessarily giving the clues and putting your cones out. It's the discussion after the round where what do you mean you think shark teeth are this color? They're obviously way more yellow. Or you start talking about how, you know what, there are actually multiple different colors of tulip, which is an actual conversation I have with someone after a game who was picturing red ones when I pictured yellow. All right. And that was cues and cues. And if you happen to work at a biotech startup, maybe you can put clones down on the board. There you go. If you work at a paint factory or something, you know, if you're, if you're in the paint department at Home Depot, you got to bring hues and cues. But then you got to call them out by their Pantone colors and not the actual numbers on the board. It'd be too easy. You just show up you're like Pantone 2568. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, that's Bayer eggshell. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. All right. We do have some honorable mentions tonight. Not a, just kind of a random number. Uh, every single one of these are games I see people recommend often, but are games I have not played or don't personally enjoy. Um, all the power to you. If you enjoy these games, you're welcome to enjoy them. I'm not trying to say they're bad games, but I want to put them out there for people to check out because even though I don't like them, you may enjoy them as well or as uh, more than I do enjoy them as well when I don't. Uh, number one is Escape Curse of the Temple. This is just one I don't own. This is a Queen Games game where you build the temple out of tiles and you roll dice furiously to a soundtrack and you are rolling and rolling and moving your people and trying to escape Indiana Jones style from the temple that is, you know, cursing you and like you'll be cursed so you can't roll different dice. Uh, to be honest, I've never actually played this, but I've seen it played. Um, our friend Jamie, uh, Will Chamberlain in the chat, if he happens to be present tonight, I don't know if he's there, um, has brought it out to multiple events and really enjoyed it. This game's old enough, though, that when we used to play, he brought a CD player. So I have to assume there's probably an app version of a, the Escape from the Curse of the Temple soundtrack, or it's on Spotify or something now, and you don't need a CD to play. But really, uh, the Fast Furious and like a step up from Fuse, if you want more of a gamer's game with that kind of same feel, kind of like Fuse. And that was Escape Curse of the Temple. And this next one's popped up a few times in our chat room already. And that is Love Letter and all the various versions of it. The 18 card game that, that has popped up and taken the world by storm. I don't know what it is. I don't love Love Letters. I, I never have since the first time I played it. The original edition with the, the little red cubes for hearts and, and the original theme. Um, then I actually I thought I would prefer the Japanese theme because it was originally a Japanese game that was translated into English where it's all about getting a letter to a princess. Even that one, like I like the art on it better, but I don't love it. Of all of them, my favorite is actually Lucha Efe, which is a worldwide wrestling or wrestling luchador, technically, um, game where you actually are playing two cards. So you have your character and someone in your corner. That's my personal favorite version of Love Letter, but it is extremely popular. You can get the Jabba's Palace version. You can get Adventure Time version. There's a million different versions of Love Letter out there. Very popular for a large group of people. Sorry, I don't love it. Just not the game for me, but I totally get it. And I got to say, for time, space constraints, perfect for a break time. And that was Love Letter and all the various versions of Love Letter. Next, I have One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which could be One Night Ultimate whatever. I put werewolf on this list, but there's superheroes, there's villains, there's vampires, there's a Daybreak expansion. 
This takes that social deduction game of Werewolf and does two very important things. For one, it makes it one round. You literally play one round of Werewolf and figure out who it is at the end. The second thing it does is removes the requirement to have a moderator, which I've got to say is a huge improvement. That's something I do not like about many of the Werewolf and Mafia and Do You Worship Cthulhu games, is someone doesn't get to play the game. I still don't love social deduction, so that's why this is in our honorable mentions. It's not my favorite mechanic. It's probably my least favorite mechanic. But if you're going to convince me to play one of these games, the one night version is what I prefer. And uh, it's up to you whether or not social deduction and possibly lying to your co-workers <laughs> is going to be a healthy workplace experience. Though there's a lot less lying in the one night one. It's much more deduction and pointing at people. You don't get the whole discussion. No, I'm not a werewolf because of this as much in this particular game, which is why I think I do tolerate this one more. And that is the one night ultimate series. All right. This one, I feel bad. Because every time people talk about quick, fast-playing games, they talk about cockroach poker. I have had cockroach poker show up anytime I talk about quick games, filler games, great filler games. I need to do it sometime and do some research. I have no idea what this game's about. I, I have never looked it up. I should have, before the show tonight, verified exactly what it was about. I know it's it's a, a card game. That's all I can tell you. And the fact that if I didn't mention it, someone in the comments would have mentioned where's cockroach poker. All right. And well, if you happen to work at, uh, I don't know, a uh, exterminator company, maybe cockroach poker would be perfect for your lunchroom. I am very glad you went with exterminator. I thought you were going somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, I have one. Our chat room is already called out, and that is zombie dice from Steve Jackson Games. There are other versions of this, too. There's like alien dice and there's expansions for this. And it's basically a push your luck game where you keep rolling the dice and trying to escape from the zombies and not get bit. Um, great, quick playing, fast game, silly fun, highly random, not a lot of player agency, but still enjoyable because of that. I don't love it. I find it's a little too random for that same type of game. I'd rather play, say, Dead Man's Draw, but I get it. People love this game and I think it belongs at least as an honorable mention tonight. Yeah, that was Zombie Dice. And now the next one's name might put some people off, but it could be worth convincing them to get past that. And that is Monopoly Deal. The It's the good version of Monopoly or the there's actually a good version of Monopoly. It's Monopoly Deal or no, there is actually one good Monopoly game out there version of Monopoly, as we've been told many, many times. Uh, similar to Cockroach Poker, I've got to say someday I'm going to pick this game up and I'm going to play it. I, I think the Monopoly game name does scare me away, despite the assurances of many, many gamers. This is actually a good game. It's all about collecting a set of um properties in your hand uh interestingly uh we would have had a copy of monopoly deal but during a black friday sale i could not get it into my checkout box wow. i could not i could not it was like three dollars <laughs> on amazon and it for whatever reason the site was having problems and i could not buy a copy of monopoly deal See, I keep seeing it for 12 bucks at our local shopper's drug mart, and I just know that's higher than it should be. So I, I just can't do it. I, I correction from our chat room. Again, these are games I don't play myself. So Zombie Dice actually, so you are the zombie trying not to get shot. Right. So I have played a game where you were playing the humans trying not to get bit. So I don't know if that's a very, an expansion or what. So correction on Zombie Dice, you are the zombies trying to not get shot. Next, we have another push your luck game that everyone recommends. It's from Oink Games. It's called Deep Sea Adventure. Based on every podcast that mentions this, every review I've seen, it's amazing. I personally can't justify the cost on Oink Games. Oink Games are way too expensive for how small they are. But based on everyone's recommendation, it seems like it's really worth it. The game's probably going to get enough play to justify the price. It's all about diving deep underwater based on dice rolls and deciding when to start coming back up. Uh, it's kind of like, I don't know, a, a multiplayer can't stop going deeper. I, I've heard lots of good things. I just, I hate Oink Games price points, though obviously it works well enough for them because enough people recommend Deep Sea Adventures. All right, well, that is it for a not-so-short list of shorter <laughs> games great for playing during a break from work. Well, what's your favorite short game? Let us know in the comments. Now, we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder that we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. 
clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, sending an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hitting me up on social media could get your ans- questions answered. You can find me everywhere online as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Smash Up Disney Edition from The Op, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this latest ed- edition of the well-known Smash Up line. Smash Up Disney Edition is a new standalone Smash Up game that is also compatible with all previously released Smash Up content. It was designed by Sean Fletcher and Paul Peterson and features original artwork from Rick Hutchinson, Delaney Mammer, and Francisco Rico Torres. This new Smash Up core set was published in 2022 as a joint collaboration between The Op and AEG. This box plays two to four players with games taking anywhere from half an hour to an hour, depending on player familiarity with the game. This Disney version of Smash Up is listed as ages 12 plus, which seems just a tad high to us, though this is in no way a kid's game and has an MSRP of $34.99 US. Now in Disney Smash Up, players select two fan favorite Disney movies, to smash together and team up in an effort to control bases for points. 20 card decks are selected from Frozen, Big Hero 6, Wreck-It Ralph, The Lion King, Mulan, Aladdin, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and Beauty and the Beast. These decks are shuffled together to become your play deck. It's then up to you to figure out the various combos, symmetries, and synchronicities between your play decks, play characters and actions to raise your power on various bases in play, then score points based on your relative power when each base reaches its power level. Now, to get a good look at the contents of this new Smash Up box, check out our Smash Up Disney Edition unboxing video on YouTube. So in this set, you get eight different decks, a number of two-sided counters, which is something new with this version of Smash Up, designed to better track power-ups versus points, new base cards and counters to track the brace break point of your bases and the power levels at each base. There's a plastic insert designed to hold each deck separate from the others with plenty of room to add in other smash up card sets. There are some large plastic dividers, which don't actually work with this insert. These are actually for use with smash up the big geeky and bigger geekier boxes. We like to use these for drafting decks as they include some helpful summary info for each card set's play style. Then finally, there is a rather thick rulebook. This rulebook is a testament to how long Smash Up's been around for and how many edge cases have come up over the years. It reads somewhat like a set of card game tournament rules, making sure to get into every single little keyword with various timing rules. While thick, the rules, though, are very clear and easy to understand. Overall, I was happy with the component quality here and really appreciate some of the new additions like the new base mats and counters and the unambiguous rulebook. Now let's move on to an overview of play. So start with everyone picking their pair of decks to match together. Now to facilitate this, I recommend using those plastic dividers because they give you an idea of how each deck plays as well as each getting a difficulty rating with some decks being honestly much easier to play than others. We prefer to use the who's on your side drafting system presented in the rules where one player picks a faction, then each other player around the table picks one faction. The last player then picks a second faction and things wrap back around the table so that the first player picks their second faction last. Now, once everyone has their cards, they should pull out the two blue backed bases from their decks, then shuffle the two decks together thoroughly into a single play deck. All the base cards from all the players are then combined and shuffled as well. A number of base mats are put out equal to the player count plus one, and random bases from the decks chosen are placed on each of these. Tokens are placed on the mat at the break point of the card and at the zero point for power. Everyone draws five cards and can take a mulligan if they have no characters in their starting hand. The start player begins the game, which will continue around the table clockwise until someone has at least 15 points at the end of their game. At that point, if two or more players tie for points, everyone plays an additional turn until someone has the most points and is declared the winner. Each turn in Smash Up Disney Edition, you can play one character card from your hand to a base, 
and or play one action card in any order. As each card is played, you will activate the effects on the card and follow through any effect chains created by that card. Now, all characters have a power rating. The current power token for the base should be adjusted after each character is played at a base. If that token meets or passes the breakpoint token, that base will score at the end of the active player's turn. Now, most characters also have special abilities. These can go off when the card is played. They could be a talent that can be activated every turn. It could be an ongoing ability that stays in play as long as the card's in play. It could be a combination of all of these with an effect going off when you play it and then having a talent you could use later. It's certainly not worth getting into the details here, but these kind of abilities do all sorts of things, like add power to this character or another, allow you to play additional character cards or action cards, manage your hand, discard, draw additional cards, and many other effects. Now, action cards come in a variety of types as well, and similar to characters, all do something different. They could add or take away power from cards in play. They could adjust the breakpoint of bases. They could have players draw or discard cards. They can let you pull specific cards from your deck. They can mess with your discard pile and more. Now, most action cards are one and done. You play them, carry out their effect, and then discard them. But there are also base and character modifier cards. These are played on existing cards in play and stay in play until the card they are attached to is removed from play. Now, in addition to this, each base also has its own set of rules on it, which can also include an assortment of things like letting you move characters to or from that base, letting you return characters to the base after it scores, or sorry, from the base after it scores, increasing the power of the cards played at that base, allowing you to play additional cards and more. There are a ton of different card effects in this game between the base, character, and action cards, and it's those abilities and the way they interact that makes Smash Up what it is, and this Disney edition is no exception. Now, at the end of a player's turn, if any bases have hit their breakpoint, they score. We like to call this the base pops when this happens. Each base card lists point values, three point values, and these are awarded to the players with the most, second most, and third most power at the location when it pops with detailed rules for ties included in the rules. Note that a number of action, character, and base card abilities can trigger just before or after a base pops. Now, after a base scores, all cards are returned to their owners, discarded, and a new base is drawn from the deck. The two base tracking tokens are reset, and the next base that popped this turn is scored, if there are any more. The active player then draws two cards from their deck. While it is not stated in the Smash Up Disney Edition rulebook, it is a standard rule in all Smash Up games that at this point, if the active player has more than 10 cards in their hand, they must discard down to 10. It has been confirmed with the designers that this rule is meant to be in place for this edition, but was missed in the rulebook. Yeah, I thought it was worth mentioning during this review in case you weren't aware. Now, once all bases are scored, you check to see if the game ends. Remember, a player needs to have 15 or more points for this to happen, or if the game continues to the next player. For the most part, these rules are identical to the rules for every other edition of Smash Up, and the cards here are totally compatible with all previous and future sets. A significant change here, though, is that the cards you play on bases are called characters, and not minions, and when combining this set with most other, uh, all minions are characters and all characters are minions. Also, in an effort to be more clear, they replace the word transfer with move when referring to moving cards or relocating characters' minions. Also, the power tokens and base mats are actually totally new with this core set. Now that you have a rough idea of how Smash Up Edition plays, Disney Edition plays, let's move on to our thoughts. So I have to admit, I haven't played Smash Up in a very long time. I played it back when it was the new hotness, and I did have some fun with it. Now, I played a few more times with other people's copies over the years, and I'm sure some of those plays included expansions. So when I got the offer to review Smash Up Disney Edition, I took it as a chance to see how the game has evolved and give it another try. Now, one thing I expected from this new edition was for it to be a lighter, more entry-level game due to having the Disney license. I was expecting something more like my first Smash Up, the kind of game that they sell at mass market stores, hoping to lure in a new demographic to the full game. Boy, was that wrong. That's not at all what Smash Up Disney Edition is. This is a full, complete version of Smash Up with all of the rules, complexity, and card variety 
that this series of games has to offer. Now, this is going to be a great thing for long-time Smash Up fans looking to add new, compatible content to their games. But I don't know if this particular game has the broad appeal I expect from games with the Disney name. Though, based on other games we've reviewed recently, like Disney Sidekicks, maybe it's me who has to change my expectation of what to expect from a Disney game. It's no longer the case that when you see that Disney logo, you're going to find a children's product in there. In large part, I think, because of their wide growth through acquisitions, they are simply trying to be more than a single thing, suitable for a wider group. So the big thing with all versions of Smash Up, including this Disney edition, is that the game is all about learning and knowing the cards. Not only the cards in the decks you're playing, but the cards your opponent's decks as well. This is a game, like many collectible or living card games, where learning to play well pretty much means turning the game into a lifestyle. To learn all the nuances, you have to play often with different people, trying different decks and combinations. You may even want to spend time between plays, looking through the decks, trying out sample lands and draws, playing against yourself or more, just to better learn the ins and outs of the various options and cards included in Smash Up. I can totally see taking a deck or two and sitting down, going through them to think about the interactions and combos over a nice cup of coffee. Now, all of this can easily become overwhelming. Anytime I played this Disney version of Smash Up with someone who hasn't played Smash Up before, they start off the game rather lost. Even experienced card game players who haven't played Smash Up before aren't sure exactly what to do with all the information they're presented with. There is a lot going on in this game and a lot to try to remember on each turn. With four players, you need to remember what all five bases in play do, how they interact with the cards in your hand. Depending on the deck you're playing, you may also need to walk what cards are you're discarding as much as what you have left in your hand. All decks benefit from you knowing what's in your deck, including how many copies of each card. And all of that is without even considering what your opponents have going on. Due to the amount of information you need to process while playing this game, it is not going to be for everyone. Now, on the other side of the coin, though, long-time Smash Up fans I played Smash Up Disney Edition with love it. They love the new combos. They love having more options, and they appreciate the fact this isn't a simplified version of the game. The eight new decks here are all very valid options combined with their own or paired with earlier sets. These people thrive on having more cards to learn and more interactions to figure out. If you love the exploring and learning, memorizing, and developing new plays, there is certainly a lot here to work with. Now, speaking of combining this set with previous mashup sets, I do appreciate that this box is fully compatible, though I don't think they would have released it otherwise because putting out a mashup game that doesn't work would have been torpedoing themselves, I think, in that case. Now, what I do find it a bit odd, they changed the name from Minion to Character, but I think that could be a licensing thing because of Disney, because they probably can't use the name Minion due to Universal Studios. So this is just a minor annoyance, but it can confuse some players who aren't used to it. Similarly, the Marvel edition, also a Disney property, made the same change for possibly that same reason. My apologies. I don't know what's going on, but my phone just blew up. <laughs> Hopefully that won't all end there. All right, where am I? Sorry. Um. I also appreciate the new bits that Disney edition of Smash Up brings to the game in the form of the two-sided counters. Um, instead of just having one set of counters that you use to track upgrades and victory points, you now have uh, counters with pluses on the one side, so they're clearly bonuses. The new base mats are fantastic with their tracking tokens. Now, I will admit there are some hardcore Smash Up fans that think it should be up to the players playing to keep track of what power level every base is at and who's winning. But this information has always been public, and you just have to take the time to do the math. And I would rather players were rewarded for their skill in playing the right cards at the right time and figuring out combos, rather than their observation and quick math skills. I agree. And frankly, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed playing it without that, or at least until I'd managed to learn the reflex of looking at each base and mentally tallying the cards, tokens, modifiers, etc., now, one the, uh, note, though, is that these are just small tokens lying there and can be very easily knocked. So it's still worth checking your math pretty regularly. 
Plus, just with all the different interactions, rechecking the totals at bases is probably just something you should do every now and then, regardless. Definitely after it pops, make sure you do a recount to confirm that the pop did happen. Now, another bonus of this new edition is the comprehensive detailed rule book that is much more thorough than the original. And I'm sure this just comes with the game's age, with multiple expansions and core sets coming out, and various tournaments and organized play events and other feedback coming from players of the game. Every time I had a timing issue or didn't quite get how a card worked, or we had a question like, can I play that here, or what happens when this happens? We were able to find an answer right in the rulebook. It's been a long time since I played a game I didn't have to Google anything, and I do appreciate that. Absolutely. But of course, that detail comes at the expense of size, and they didn't include an index, as I expect it would be far too difficult, considering the sheer amount of text on each page. Now, one final thing I do want to talk about before we finish up is the game length of Smash Up Disney Edition. So first off, this game is significantly longer at the max player count. Now, this is due not only to the fact you have more players taking turns, that's obviously going to have an impact, but also the fact there are just more bases in play. So there's more things to read and remember and that can interact with each other, which can lead to even more AP or analysis paralysis. And overall, this AP can be a huge issue when playing with players just learning the game and even experienced players that can come up. Now, I'm going to call out in particular my oldest daughter, who is a very tactical player. When she plays any board game, she likes to think out every possible action and weigh them against each other before making a move. Well, this Disney version of Smash Up proved to be a bit too much for her. There was just too much to consider and think about where she didn't want to make the wrong move and her turns became excessively long. And I've got to say, I can tell from the rules, this has been a problem for other people. Because even the book recommends, hey, just play a card and see what happens when learning the game. The problem is convincing a competitive player to actually do that. Now, one helpful feature is the right in the rulebook. It has some great suggestions for starting smash ups that can help introduce mm -hmm. people to the game. Now, it won't help with the AP, but it can at least make your decks work together more naturally before you have to start worrying about some of the more obscure and creative interactions. Very true. Now, a surprise for me regarding player count is how well it played with only two players. Um, the reason I say this is area majority style games don't tend to work well with anything less than three players. There's very few area majority games I found I enjoy with two, but somehow Smash Up manages to make it work rather well. While I still say I prefer it with at least three, I can totally see playing this two player. And I gotta say, the two player games are at least much shorter than playing with more. We did, however, notice that it was possible in two player to get to a point where even before a player reached 15, they had essentially won the game where any base that popped would give the player in the lead more than 15 uh, points. Yeah, there's, a, there's edge cases there where perhaps the other player could score a base without any of the active player being there. That's a hard one to pull off. I think that's, that, that takes a master player to be able to get out of that. Yeah. So what I do recommend is if you do get to that point, probably end the game and play another round at that point. So overall, I was impressed by Disney's Smash Up, or I should say the full name is technically Smash Up Disney Edition, even if it wasn't quite what I was expecting. I really thought I was getting a lighter version of Smash Up with a Disney theme, and I agreed to review this thinking, I'm going to play this with my kids and see if they dig it. They really like, um, they like board games, but they really like Disney and the Disney licenses, and I thought a nice light Smash Up would be fun for them. And instead, I got a, a fully functional, just as detailed and complex as past sets version of Smash Up. Uh, this new version includes some useful upgrades and has proven to be popular with Smash Up fans, but it just wasn't what I was expecting. This game can be overwhelming for new players, and that alone is going to turn people off. Though people willing to stick with the game and learn the various cards and their combos will be rewarded with a very replayable tactical and strategic card game. People who enjoy that tactical play, combined with a small dose of luck, uh, will likely be drawn to this. But make sure you already have other people interested in mind. This isn't going to be a game people learn to love in time. They're either going to like it or not. Now, if you're a Smash Up fan, don't let the Disney theme scare you away if it might. This is a complete new smash up box set with eight new factions for the game you love 
factions that work great together and combo well with the sets you already have. As an added bonus, you get some improved tokens and, in my opinion, a better way to track base power levels. Though, of course, if you hate them, you can just as easily leave the bases in the box and play old school or start with them in to learn and then remove them once everyone is up to speed. Now, if you enjoy area majority games, I think Smash Up's a neat one worth checking out. Instead of a map in cubes or minis, you're battling over card locations with character cards and power-ups, which your group might really enjoy. This new Disney edition is a good place to smart start a Smash Up journey. Now, familiar characters that actually match deck theme to their characters rather well make this actually rather thematic. If you can ever step back and not spend all your time trying to figure out how to hit that next giant combo. Now, a group that may not have tried Smash Up in the past, but that should, are competitive card game players. Smash Up Disney Edition provides all of that deck mastery, combo, finding, synchronicity, discovery you love without the cost of having to keep up with the latest releases and an evolving meta. Similarly, if you've become addicted to Marvel's Snap on mobile, <laughs> while not the same, there are a lot of similarities you may enjoy, and the game will feel somewhat familiar to you. Yeah, I had the opposite. Coming as someone who is experienced with Smash Up, I found Snap to be a very quick-playing, simplified version of Smash Up. Now, if you tried Smash Up in the past and weren't impressed or didn't enjoy it, I don't think this new edition does anything different enough to win you over. Unless, of course, you're a huge Disney fan and the Disney license will make you overlook any problems you had. Or if your main complaint was tracking the map, because the new mats do make that much easier as long as everyone will use it. So if your main complaint was tracking that math, you may want to give this a shot. Even if some players choose not to use them, it is a great advantage as a tool for onboarding players and helping them learn the game. Now, for anyone else, this is very much a try before you're by. And if possible, I recommend trying twice with the same set of cards, the same smashed up deck. There is just far too much going on in this game to really grasp it with one play. Personally, I'm glad to have this in my collection, but it doesn't have me rushing out to pick up more smash up sets and expansions to add to it. Though I will say, if more Disney sets are released, I will be tempted to pick those up. Well, that's it for our review of Smash Up Disney Edition, a complete new Smash Up core set fully compatible with everything that has come before. And while a good entry point to the series, not a simplified My First Smash Up as we'd been expecting. Now, before I go, I do want to invite you to check out my written review of this Disney version of Smash Up over at the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since the last episode. All right, so most of our gaming this past week happened at the Barbershop Bar on Howard here in Windsor, Ontario at Howard and Eugenie for those locals, where I hosted my first, co-hosted, I should say, along with Ian from the CG Realm, my first public play event of 2023. Uh, we went in early so we could have some food, so we started off with some Coney Dogs, which were as good as ever. Though after ordering, hearing Sean talk about the pulled pork sandwich on tater tot waffles made me kind of wish I'd only gotten one Coney and maybe saved some room. And that's Sean the cook at the barbershop bar, not yes. Sean from Hamilton or Sean no longer from Hamilton or Sean Hamilton. Yes. Wait, there's Sean no longer from Hamilton and Sean Hamilton? <laughs> or sorry, and Sean from Hamilton? Uh, right. I think there was an extra Sean there besides the cook. We know <laughs> a lot of Seans. I collect Seans. Got to catch them all. They scared us at one point with a suggestion that we wouldn't be able to get the Coney dogs. But the rumor proved thankfully untrue. And so I got to my first public event in a number of years. Yeah, I was impressed because it ends up they sold out of Coney sauce. So the, the proper good Coney sauce takes time to prepare ahead of time. You have to and sit actually, out on a counter in like warm weather for three days. You know, it's, it's something like that. I think it had I think heat lamps have to be involved. Uh, for it to actually taste right. No, um, <laughs> in all fairness, they had a extremely popular karaoke night the night before and sold out of conies. And Sean had to rush to make us conies. So despite the fact we had fresh coney dogs, which actually isn't a good thing, it should age. Aged coney dogs are better. Um, <laughs> it was still damn good. All right, moving on to the games. Our first game play was Sean and I playing a two-player game of Smash Up Disney Edition. 
and prep for tonight's review, which went good enough. And we just talked a lot about Smash Up Disney. Yep. Though I have to say, a game with lots of reading of small text at odd angles, trying to get view everything, isn't helped by dance floor lighting. Yeah, the I, I don't want to say too much about that because I'm hoping it's not a problem next time. But they had a problem where they couldn't turn off the dance lights for a gaming event. And that was it could be a bit of an issue. Hopefully nothing we need to mention again, and it'll be fixed by next time. And they did turn up all the other lights. So it's not like yes. it was dark with dance floor, light, floor lighting. It was just every once in a while you had something flashing across your table. Yes, trying to take pictures from my reviews. I have an awful lot that are blue and red and other colors. It's not great. Uh, next up was a group game of Ven. Um, I know we talk about how much we like to play games before we review them, but because of COVID and restrictions, we haven't been able to play some of these games at the higher player counts. And I've got to say that it plays very different and honestly much better in teams. So I don't feel this a point where I need to go correct my review because it's just better. But I kind of wish we had gotten that in just so I could say, play this with at least six people to 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 for it to really shine. Because having two or three other people to bounce ideas off of makes a huge difference in guessing words. But even more importantly, as the pitcher placer, I'm going to call it, you can hear when the group's off on the wrong track and try to course correct. And this actually, because again of pandemic, was my first time with the game. And I must say, I would actually not want to play it with less players than that, having played it at that count to start. Mm. Um, when you were off teaching another game, and it was just Scott and I on the team. It was a very different experience than having that second person guessing. Yeah, what I would actually recommend is the game does have a soul, a, a cooperative mode. If you have four or less players, play cooperatively, where you have the clue givers take turns and you're trying to get the rest of your team to get points. I, I got to say the game worked out great. It did a bit of the draw crowd. You had some of that going on. I think it would draw more if there were more people not gaming. But at that point, we were playing that. Most people were already involved in their own games. But did get some onlookers over, um, and we managed to rope in someone who was extremely nervous at their first ever event, who thought it was a D and D night, who actually had a lot of fun. So it was always good to get someone else involved, someone who probably had no clue that that's what board games could be. So that was enjoyable. Uh, now Sean mentioned me teaching, so in the middle of this game, I taught but didn't play a game of Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. So this is the being a good host we've talked about before hosting game events, one of the things I must do as a host is, yes, I love to play games, and I try to play games when I'm at these events, but hosting comes first, and sometimes I'll have to leave a game, which is where Ven's great for that, because I can jump out in the middle. And I went over and taught Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, which went really well, as far as I can tell. Um, there were two non-board gamers, again, playing this for the first time. Uh, one player who later interacted with Deanna said his favorite game is Monopoly and uh, Clue, I think it was, or Game of Life. So... That was their board game experience. And here I'm tossing a, a, a roll and write to them, which I got to say, a roll and write's a pretty good one. Monopoly and Game of Life. Sorry, they're their favorite games from Monopoly and Game of Life. And here you are throwing an, a, a roll and write at them. And I got to say, it worked good as an intro to, hey, this isn't Monopoly or Game of Life. It, it, the, you're rolling nice not to move, right? <laughs> so that was a cool intro. And I think the game seemed to go really well. I wasn't there for the whole game because once they seemed to have a grasp, I went back to my game of Ven. And they only came over with questions once along the way. So uh, they obviously grokked it pretty well. Yeah, and I got to thank um, formerly Sean Hamilton for teaching that one because uh, we're, we're pricking it up because I've gamed with Sean for a number of years. Sorry, formerly Sean. I've gamed with Weird for a number of years, and they really helped to keep the group on track. I think he had to come over twice during the game just to, to ask me a couple questions but as an experienced gamers and props to grand gamers no not grand gamers field daily magic games for an awesome reference card because that is i think the big saving factor there the questions i did get were about statues and not how to play yep. uh up next was a five player game of thrones of valeria i wish we had found a six player i wish the green haired girl hadn't gone off to her own group to play munchkin um, cause I really wanted to play with six. I still dig this game. This is a fantastic trick taking game. I don't care if there's nothing actually Valeria about it. This is one of the best trick taking games I've played. Works great. Five players, just ah, better teams. Someday I'll try it in teams. Someday. I, this is probably going to be a staple of our, of our yeah. events, at least for the next little while. A nice quick one to throw in there. It's easy to teach to anyone who already knows trick taking. I think it's going to, it's going to be another, another staple of ours. So I think you'll get a chance at some point. 
Uh, next was Monstrosity. Um, this, again, played better with more players, um, especially the voting. Because once we're, when we only, we have only ever played with four players, and the voting, you get a lot of ties or you get a lot of one person just dominates, where it was really nice to get different people's voting, how they voted, I guess. Like there was obviously someone at the table who was voting on best looking pitcher. There was someone else voting very much based on the concept of the card. And then there was someone else that had to do, I could tell they were voting based on shape, like how close the shapes matched more than if it had the right appendages. So I thought that was fascinating that everyone was voting different. And what I liked is one of my previous complaints about this game is that the players that can draw the best have an advantage. I did not feel that during this game at all. And we did have one player who was a, you know, art major who had yes. very clearly the moment you turned over the boards. Oh, well, I know who drew that one, but it yes. wasn't necessarily the best one. Uh, yeah. in, in only a couple of instances was there's the most accurate to the card. Uh, it, it may have looked the best, but if it didn't match the card, there's didn't no real the point. Card. Yep. Uh, I, I was surprised at how long that yeah. game took, though. <laughs> and yeah, that wasn't even the max player count. Uh, yeah, we, we fact, only played half a game. Yeah, and I mean, like, it's it's a set timer. I mean, you've got a 20-second timer and a two-minute timer, uh, but with all the voting and, and you know, moving moving boards around and collecting and dis distributing and erasing, it, it does eat up some time. Yeah. Well, we did, we did house rule one thing where people would uh, collect the things and shuffle them so we don't know whose was whose. I think that just took too much time. Like, I like the idea of it, but I think we were better just flopping out our things. Possibly. Um, it did. It made for a better experience voting. It though. did, honestly. But then you started to know everyone's drawing style. So by the end, I kind of knew whose was whose anyway. Well, so I, I mean, the numbers are there. So, I mean, yeah. after, you know, after you've had, the, especially after you've uh, had the scorecard once, you know what everyone's yes. number is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we only played one round. We only played half a game, which I got to say is a bit of a knock against the game. Because here we are in pretty much a party game light atmosphere. Uh, with dance music lights going on, not dance music, but lights going on. Actually, there was music too. Yeah, yeah, there great was, 80s tra yeah. tracks all night. They had 80s tracks all night. Yeah, that, that it, it, it surprised me. Um, this one's not obligation. I don't know if we'll do a review, but I'm going to have some mixed thoughts on this one, which I'm a little surprised, especially because I knew exactly what I was getting into when I got it. And I'm yeah. kind of surprised by some of these re revelations. I'm happy, though, that the drawing thing didn't pan out, that it yeah. wasn't just it's like that obviously is very crowd dependent on who yep. you're playing with, how things are going to go voting. Now, I suspect if you had a couple who were, where, where at least one of them was a skilled drawer and they had a level of communication uh, that was already established, you may yeah. see a difference. But uh, but in general, just the, the, the drawing skill does not make it as big a deal. Not, no. Uh, next up was Drop It, which I knew this when we reviewed this. I never got to bring it out to a public play event before we brought it before we reviewed it, but we knew it would be a hit, and sure enough, it was. This is the one that drew a crowd. We had people from all over the bar walk over to... We didn't get the, what are you doing? I think we had a lot of uh, nervous, shy gamers there, but they would stand on the periphery and watch, and then a few had, had uh, actually came up and were like, what are you doing? And then we did the, the thing I like to do as a host, which is now you're playing. You know, you walked up to ask what's going on. Here you go, drop a piece. And that's a game that as soon as you drop one piece, you're sold. Um, what I love the most about that is this is an all ages event, despite being at a place called a bar. It is the barbershop bar restaurant it is an all ages event. And we had, I would say, three generations of gamers playing that at once, at least if not four. If you count Cat's baby being with us, <laughs> though they didn't play, <laughs> we definitely had four or five generations of gamers standing at that table. Yeah, it is such a great choice for all ages and skills. And what we did actually to make it to help make it a, a, a better draw is we moved from a, you know, a, a low sit table to a high top. Mm -hmm. um, so every, and that way everyone could move around because we were playing it as a team game. Uh, and that way you could move around and look at the different angles and try and get a better judge for where you might want to drop. Mm -hmm. But it also meant everyone around the bar could see the game at yes. a distance. And that made for a great choice. Yeah, you almost think I knew what I was doing with that one. Uh, what I will say about that one is how much more fun it was with teams. Mm -hmm. It worked really well as a team game. Kind of like my complaints about Codenames Duet. Don't put a four on the box. Yeah. Put two plus, two or more players, because it played really well team-based. 
Yep. Like we were talking about what you should drop and you have your partners there to go, no, 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 don't do that. Cause you're going to, they yep. catch your mistakes. Like it worked really well. Although I have to say, I still caught myself stopping the other team when it's when well, it yes, a really know. obvious mistake. It's like when you're, when you're holding a triangle directly over top of a triangle and it's obvious that they've looked at all the colors and yeah. not looked at shapes. I, I can't stop myself from stopping them, even though they're the opponents. See, I didn't mind doing that because we have people who've never played before. Yeah. If it was all people who had played before, I probably would try to be a little quieter. But you know what? I'm <laughs> all it was all about having fun anyway. Yeah. Um, I taught another game with Dice Kingdoms. Sean played in this one, helped me teach it, which was appreciated. Um, in the middle of that one, so I was just watching. I hear someone, other side of the bar, far end of the, well, not the other side, but we were kind of in the middle. So there was the left side, the bar's L shape. So not where Deanna was, but over on the other side. I hear someone talking to someone else. I hear, see that drop it game? Did that ever look messed up? So I'm like, went, grabbed the game, walked over. I'm like, so you're curious about drop it? You want to learn to play? He's like, yeah, sure. So I played that game and totally blew this dude's mind. Like he was like, what is even happening? Like I had the Tory for the queen comments <laughs> while playing this. He's like, what is this? Is this even a game? What are we doing? This isn't a board. Is this the board? The boards are supposed to be flat. Like just totally blew this dude's mind. He had a great time. He loved it. He wanted to know if he could pick it up. Like, is this game in print? Can I grab a copy of this? And just was, and he did had the, you know, dropped the first piece and was like, well, that didn't do what I thought it would do. And then got to the point where he's like, oh, wow. I, I, I chose my pieces badly earlier. Now I'm left with like, got all of the experience that we've had when we first played it years ago. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, and while you were doing that, uh, five player dice kingdoms. Uh, and again, you know, Levi has said that five player is fine and he does play fine. There's no, uh, there's no reason not to, but I have to say while not long, it's just a bit, almost too long. And yeah. I'm starting to see for that reason, probably why they took the fifth player off the box. Um, yeah, it, it, fair just, enough. it just, it just stretches out bit longer than you want it to and i know tory's kind of getting tired of it as well he was he was clearly done with uh done with it and i and i think the fact that we've played the last two times at five players mm -hmm. may go to part of why he has uh grown away from it yeah that that is the disadvantage of us trying to fit in a number of games in a short period of time for our reviews is we do play games probably more frequently than the average person would Though I do know some people get their new game and go bonkers for it and just play it like crazy. But I know the average gamer who probably listens to our show tends to split up various new hotnesses with their old favorites. Um, so I think that was the problem here is, is we, I got Tori to play this one of you too many times in a row. Um, plus, he was just burnt out. He hit a wall. He I, he got silly while playing Drop It. And I think he used up all his energy and was just done. And, right and he'd, had, he'd worked that day already. Yes. So he was tired. Now, my night finished off with Gokuku, which we had to play for Tech, who didn't show up. Who well, actually, I don't even, it was in our chat earlier tonight. Not sure if he's there. So I packed it just for Tech, and he didn't show up. So I had to play it and send him pictures on <laughs> Facebook of us playing, because I'm just not going to bring it next time. Be like, sorry, you missed out. <laughs> See, and this was interesting for me, because I'm, well, I've played Gokuku a number of times. This was a completely different configuration of the nest than any other time I've played it uh, in the past. And I think this is something that uh, we've had with the, the more competitive games because Dia, I think Dia's played in almost all the games mm -hmm. I've played previously. Uh, we tend to build the nest outward and get really creative with our mm -hmm. stick placement. Uh, whereas this one, we were all focusing on the center and making a, a, a strong nest, even though it didn't always work that well. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, which is interesting. I played it enough. I don't even didn't notice a difference. Like, I'm like, yeah, I guess different people build the nest differently. But yeah, I, I will have give credit to Chris Nizak as being the first player I played with that put a stick on the outside, like the far resting across sticks in the hopes that it would fall and your turn would end. So he gets credit for that. And while playing competitively, I tend to do that when I when when I can't place an egg myself, I'm going to try to sabotage it so no one else can. Now, while all of this was going on, there was plenty of other gaming. At one point, Ian and I were comparing notes. We had over 30 people show up, but not all at the same time. Between people who came and left and stuck around. And there were some people that were actually there just to have drinks at the bar that played like one game. And I counted them. As long as they played a game, I counted them. So we were at 30 people, which is pretty awesome. 
So while this was going on, there was a game of Betrayal Legacy being played. And wow, I, I don't even know. So so I I think they were trying to play the entire Legacy campaign in one sitting. And I don't think it was a group that had played it before. So I don't know what time Justin started this epic event, but they were going when we got there. Ian noted they called to see if they could come in early, and we left pretty late, like close to midnight, and they were still playing. So we're looking at at least 4.30 till midnight. At, at least. least. <laughs> yeah. They were they were absolute troopers. Yeah. I, I personally, it, it maybe Twilight Imperium, there aren't a lot of games I'd want to play that many times in a row. But I gotta say, they look like they were having fun. Yeah. My takeaway was most definitely not a game to play with my kids. You want to talk about graphic violence. Wow. Like mm -hmm. there, there were some that it beat out Aventuria for horror and, oh. and mutilation factor. So that was disturbing. I'm like, okay, I thought betrayal was more friendly, family friendly than that. Certainly not. So something I got to say less on my radar than it was before. Now throughout the event, Deanna was awesome. She did her own thing, teaching games at the other end of the venue um, being the gamer she is, she found the spot with the best lighting and just went, I'm going to be over there where <laughs> I'll be able to see everything and away from the dancing disco lights. Um, even more awesome, the bar owners came over and uh, and adjusted the lights that were pointing at like pictures on the wall to point straight down. They need more of those. Um, so that was awesome. Um, Deanna started teaching a game of Lost Ruins of Arnak. Uh, she followed that up with a failed game of Ven. Uh, those gamers who liked Monopoly and Game of Life were not rocking the concept of this party game, so they just weren't enjoying it. Um, then she taught a game of Thrones of Valeria and wrapped up with some Chiseled. Yeah, Chiseled is just so such a fantastic game and so easy to teach, quick to teach as well. Uh, locals do make note that if you're going to lose to D when playing an advanced game like Arnak, just enjoy the game for what it is, because you're going to lose when you're playing against D. <laughs> yeah, Cav, one of the local gamers who's been out to many of our events over the years, um, also very active in the local Scott community, came over and was like, okay, I appreciate your wife teaching me a game, but man, did she school us at the end and then tells us she's ranked in the top 100 in the world on Board Game Arena. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, she does that. What's funny is she told me after the fact she was taking it easy on him until the last turn and then was like, no, I'm going all out now and let's show him how you really play this game, which I thought was pretty funny. Now, other games I saw played because it wasn't just the three of us teaching and playing games. Um, Bears versus Babies, which I've got to say looked better than I thought it would for a exploding kitten style game. A couple of rounds of Wingspan. Uh, I saw at least a four player game and then a three player game. Uh, the cat game Ian was obsessed over. He couldn't stop talking about this Kickstarter $30 game that came with neoprene mats. Sorry, I don't remember the name of it. Another game about magic that seemed to have a, a Potter theme without being a Potter game that looked pretty good. I saw two rounds of Munchkin played and honestly, probably more games that I missed because I was busy either teaching something or playing myself. Yeah, I was sad that I just had completely missed Wingspan until I was looking at the pictures later. Yeah. Uh, because I, you know, having played that on board game arena now, I would really like to play that in person sometime. So I thought that's definitely got to be on my radar for next time. Now, speaking of next time for anyone listening, we're going to actually get this out in time. If you are in the Windsor, Essex, or perhaps even Detroit area, our next event will be on February the 11th, running from 6 p.m. till 10. Note that is an earlier stop time because we did notice by 10 o'clock, more than half the people had left. And yes, you're welcome to stay till close. If you want to keep playing Betrayal Legacy till 2 a.m. or whenever the bar closes, you're welcome. But the official event will be ending at 10, and we won't be there teaching games and may bring our games home before then. So if you do plan on staying late, bring your own games to play. All right. Continuing on with the past week, Sunday night at Brenda's, we got Dolce to the table for the second time. Uh, that was definitely one that played better the second time we played it, the, the learning game was rough. Um, now that Deanna and I knew how the game flows, it went better. Um, I was better able to teach it because I now knew how things were going to work. And at Sean's recommendation, I kept the player aids out of everyone's hands. Uh, both Gwen and Brenda picked it up rather quickly. Uh, Deanna did way better at the building as engine building aspects. And I enjoyed it much more than our first play. Yeah. One of the first games I've run across where the player aid is not a usable teaching tool but yeah. confuses players who don't already understand the game 
Uh, if, if you know the game, it is a useful reference tool. But a lot of times, you know, a number of games, you know, as you're setting up the game, you see a, a reference card and you pick it up and you start, you know, looking it over to try and help grok the game so it makes it easier for the teacher. Mm -hmm. But it actually made things notably worse for both D and I. Yeah. Uh, we ended up asking questions. Mo couldn't even figure out why we were asking these questions. Now I'm like, what? what but you it was because you know? these these uh, cards had some some vagaries vagaries on them that you know again made sense if you knew the game, but before you knew the game, just added to confusion. And I will admit, I read the rules before reading the reference cards, so they just made sense to me because I'd already read the rules. Now, one thing we are doing now that Sean is in town is we are trying to make Tuesday night a regular Sean game night. And to that end, we got together yesterday. Up first, we played two rounds of Dolce, which I think went rather well. Um, one game was a four-player game with Gwen, and the second three-player game with the Sean and I. And I can say the more I play this one, the more I'm enjoying it. And, man, everything makes so much more sense now than it did that first game. Like, it just... It grocks. It makes sense. It has a flow to it. There, there's more strategy than I thought. And now I know why I might do one thing over another. Yeah, and I finally figured it out. My first game, uh, again, I, it had been three weeks, I think, or since yeah. the first time I played it. Uh, and so the first game, D kept laughing because I would be picking up the reference card and looking at it and looking very angry or distressed uh, because I still wasn't quite grokking it. But I figured it out during that first game uh, mm -hmm. of the, the four-player game. Uh, and then in that third, you know, in the three player game afterwards, it flowed, it felt right. Yep. You know, the decisions came more naturally. The engine didn't work perfectly, but I had an engine that actually, yes. you know, could fire every once in a while. Uh, and it wasn't just a complete disaster like the first game. So, yeah, so far, I'm sure D will surpass me eventually, but I seem to be pretty good at this one compared to other people. Deanna tends to get obsessed with building too big of a chain. And it never quite works where I figured out that scoring a bunch of small chains quickly seems to score a little better. And I got to say, using the chicken and the eggs uh, effectively is honestly a really big part of scoring. Well, it, if, you, if your system actually has enough, um, I, I want to say refuse, I can never waste. remember. <laughs> waste not byproducts. Waste. No, byproducts. That's it. It's not waste because you're using it. Well, it, it, it's, wa it's waste as far as the rest of the, the food products go. It's if you can't use it in the food, you, you yes. get to the chicken. Yes. But like having just enough that you do like two chains, then feed the chicken actually can pay off in eggs. It's it's interesting because it's one of these engine building games where you need to control your resources as much as your engine. Yes. Uh, and finding that balance again, if you if you build too much engine, then you don't have enough resource to run the engine because mm -hmm. the same cards do both. Uh, yes. it, it's either a, you know. It's either an, uh, something for it to feed the re the engine or it's part of the engine. Uh, and you've got to make that 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 trade off decision. And mm -hmm. that's where the game really soars and seems, as Mo discovered when he read the rules the first time, seems like it's pretty simple it and straightforward. It sounds so simple. It's not. No, it does. That game sounded so simple. I read the rules and I'm like, this isn't this isn't going to be much of a game. Like, like I was thinking, not Suro level, but like like pretty down there in the complexity level and then i wow i i got props to stronghold games for signing this one because it, it's there's definitely a lot going on there and i think it fits in well with many of the other games in their in their catalog that are are much more engaging than you'd expect them to be now while we aren't reviewing this yet i will say that there are some problems with the game as well yes. this isn't a totally shining review when we do get this uh <laughs> When we do get to when we do get to doing the full review of this, there are some there are some problems with it as well. Yeah, though I got to say most of the problems are production issues, not game design issues. Yeah, not they're not gameplay issues. It's it's yeah. yeah. There, there were some aesthetic choices I find questionable. Uh, next up, and the last one to talk about tonight is Disney Sorcerer's Arena. I can't even remember the rest of the full way too long name. Or box. Limited something edition. epic alliances corset that's it <laughs> disney sources arena epic alliances corset i i was i knew it would come to me um now this game has four chapters in it when you learn to play the game and it's a an onboarding system which which we had a great discussion about onboarding a few podcast episodes back and it was kind of um i, I schadenfreude or, or like just fit 
that suddenly now I get this game with this really good onboarding system. So I, I do want to talk about that a bit when, and I'm going to mention it when we're doing the review. So since it was Sean's first time playing, I, I debated. I'm like, I could just jump to the fourth game, which is the full gamers game with all the details and detailed character cards with asymmetric abilities and leveling up and all that. But I wanted Sean to actually experience the onboarding system so he can also talk about it when we review the game. And then another bonus of Sean being in Windsor, you can actually experience the full range of the games and not just, yeah, I've been playing this 10 times here, play it once before we talk <laughs> about it online. Um, So this was only my second time sitting down. We played through chapters one and two. So, yes, we have not seen the whole game. We got to fight with the standard characters with no special rules. And then we got to play where you can discard extra cards to do extra things in three full characters that we drafted. And I'm still liking what I'm seeing with this. Like, it's, it's, I, I don't know what I expected, but I'm really enjoying it for what it is as a, as a small three team miniature skirmish game with area control points. Like kind of like a mix of War Chest and Warhammer Underworlds is kind of what it feels like to me. I'm really anxious to get to the full game rules, but that'll take a little while before we get there. Yeah, now I wouldn't say that I'm a huge fan of this style of skirmish games, uh, but it played really easily. The combos and interactions really came out naturally thanks to this onboarding system. Mm -hmm. The big thing, too, I have to credit this with, some of the best... um bits to track things i've ever seen in a game the way you do a, a initiative chain on the right hand side of the board with a token that you move to show who's active and even more so the way the status effects chain onto this and that like attach by by slotting in and then putting counters so things slowly count down i honestly have never played a, a skirmish style game like this that does it as well and I'm comparing this to the Funkoverse games because that's something else this really reminds me of is the Funkoverse game where you're drafting from uh, from disparate worlds to fight each other. Except these are all Disney. Um, like it's got a neat thing for tracking your spell counting down, but it's nothing on the awesome status effect counters or whatever. I don't even know what to call them. <laughs> like the trackers you put on the side just are really expertly designed. Yep. Now I will say one thing after playing this again that chapter one rule set would make a fantastic game for playing with young kids my kids are well past that i'm sure they'll both be great with playing chapter four but i gotta say that if if you play just the chapter one game now what i would recommend is throw in a bit of the chapter two rules pick your own characters do the little initiative thing but still only play two and don't have the play extra cards for bonuses ignore all the the, the character talents or whatever they're called and leveling up, just play with that. I think that'd be a great game, possibly as young as, uh, as, as long as they're reading age, as long as they can read their cards, I think that'd be great. And honestly, you could possibly even ditch that and just use the standard moves. But I think then the health is going to be unbalanced. Like, I think characters' health is based on how powerful their cards are. Yeah. With, with like glass cannon characters like Maleficent doing a ton of damage, but getting knocked out easily. So I think you got to use the cards. But I honestly think, like, I think I would have been playing this with my kids at, at as early as six and eight based on when they started reading. Yeah. My only complaint so far, I, again, just only playing these first two chapters is that certain icons on the cards are ridiculously small. Yeah. I mean, there's two icons that I swear they screwed up. They are Thanks. half the size of the smallest icon on a magic card, like yeah. half the size. <laughs> and that, and that's just tiny. They're bland. They're black and white. It's not like you've got color to to differentiate them with either. Yeah, I don't know what was up with those. Now, what I will say, it's just two icons to differentiate between direct attacks and indirect attacks. And it's usually really clear which is which, even without the icon. Yeah, the text the text makes it clear enough. But, the, but the it's, icons yeah, it's are, a are really pointless. odd choice that they're that's again. And I, sometimes I wonder if like they order them one size and they show up and they're like, oh, just instead of reprinting all the cards, publish it. It's like that just looks like a mistake. Now, one thing that's interesting is I do plan on uh, grabbing the app and giving it a try. So this actually started yeah, off as that. a uh, mobile only app. I tried today. You can't get it on Steam or anything. So I actually have to throw it on my phone. But uh, I want to experience that as well so that when we do the review, I can actually sort of give a comparison that, oh, you mm -hmm. know, if you liked it on the on your mobile, this is a good matching experience on the table or not. Man, we talked about this a bit after playing it, too. And honestly, this doesn't feel like it needs an app. Yeah. Like, I know it's based on an app, but it plays smooth enough. And again, the the, the components 
track things so well that I enjoyed it. Whereas the game we were just, excuse me, the game we were just talking about before this, Dolce, I think it'd make a fantastic app. Absolutely. Or at the very least, a board game arena implementation. Yep. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so this weekend, Deanna and I are taking uh, one of our short breaks. We're going out of town to our usual spot for two nights, three days. I'm sure there'll be some two-player gaming going on, um, including, I'm sure, some Racco. So I think this time we're going to bring our own copy because the bar copy is getting pretty rough. And the last time I was there, we didn't see it at Banded Goose. Now, I will admit the people we stay with know us well enough. They had put it in our room last time. So that was kind of a bonus. And I, I kind of felt bad because if anyone else like listens to us and showed up out there to play Racco, it wasn't there for them because we had it. So I'm not sure where that copy is. So we're probably going to bring ours because that's now a tradition now. And I've got to say, I love the the weird drinking, chatting, hanging out and playing a game. And I, I think we might toss some other games in there as well. So there'll be that. Um, uh, I've been learning a bit about uh, Savage Worlds. Uh, and uh, I may be uh, dabbling in some of that in uh, online in a, in a Discord I've run across in the coming weeks. So that's my new RPG experience and, uh, anyway. Now, what I really need to do is some boxings. Uh, I don't know where that's going to fit in with us going away, but like right here, I've got Sean's copy of One Deck Galaxy to open up. I've got, what else we got back here? We got a Horizon Zero Dawn expansion. Uh, another thing from Escape Welt, which I kind of feel we need to, <laughs> to do them a favor on. We've got a new copy of Azul that's been sitting over my shoulder all night. <laughs> People can see back there. There's a Scythe expansion. Like there's a bunch. Um, added to that, I've got whatever this is. So whatever this is needs to be opened, which stick around for the after show to find out what that is. And I'm so, looking, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to getting one deck galaxy to the table, but we'll have to wait until that unboxing has happened. Yeah, Sean's going to make me feel guilty about this every time <laughs> we talk to each other. Yeah, I don't know when that's fitting. Maybe tomorrow? So I don't know. I, it depends how the weather is tomorrow. Mm. Like everyone, everyone seems to be like, yeah, the snowstorm happened. Everything will be back to normal mm, tomorrow. But looking to the outside, weather, it sure doesn't look like it to me. No, according to the weather, this is keeping up until like Monday. Um, yeah, which <laughs> could be great for going out to the county. Oh, yes. Um, all right. Mm. Oh, as for games played, so I should mention again here, next week is our anniversary. Uh, we are skipping the review segment, although I was tempted to squeeze one in because there's a couple things we'd like to do. <laughs> Um, what we are going to do, because we have an anniversary that the op is sponsoring, is we are probably going to rush the Disney Epic Alliances review for reasons. Slight spoiler warning. Um, though, whoever wins, it's going to get to check out stuff we don't even have. So that's kind of cool, too. Um, so I, we kind of want to rush that. So I may get a physical review out before we reviewed on the show. Also, in two weeks' times, I would like to get in uh, Dolce, a couple more plays of that, which at this point, I'd like to try a two-player, and it does have solo rules. So I want to try the solo rules. That'll be good to go. So in two weeks' time, we should have Dolce to be reviewed and possibly Disney, Sorcerer's Arena, Epic Alliance's core set. Um, and I'm still tempted. I still have Dice Thrones. No. Um, what is Siege of Valeria? Siege of Valeria. Yeah. yeah, Siege of Valeria, which is the third in the new small box games, which at this point still hasn't hit store shelves. It's still up for pre-order everywhere I've been looking, even though it's listed as a 2022 release. I thought it was getting out to some stores, but I've only and much seen much to Tori's dismay, we still have the snow version of Dice Kingdoms as well. He doesn't have to necessarily play it. That I'm less worried about because I also have an expansion for Siege, but at least right. getting out the review for the core games. So we might jump back to that. I wanted to take at least a week off from doing Valeria games, so we didn't do one tonight, and we're not going to be there next week. So yeah, One Dex Galaxy, maybe maybe we can review that too if I can get the unboxings. The nice part is without having a review next week, I should have time to do those unboxings, if nothing else. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. To get your name on this list, you can head to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Unfortunately, we lost a couple patrons this month uh, due to financial reasons or other things happening. And it'd be nice to kind of bump that back up, but that's your choice. We would appreciate it. Thank you, though, to Donna. Thank you, Pax. Valentine Page. Thank you. Brian Sheehan, our war game fan. Thank you, Brian. Ron F. Thank you, Ron. Roger Malosh, who at this point uh, we might see in March at this rate, because unfortunately he's not free on February 11th. Thank you, Roger. 
Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as TabletopBellhop, one word, and on your peg podcatcher of choice. Again, if you dig what we're doing, it'd be awesome if you stop by Patreon.com slash TabletopBellhop to tip your bellhop. And that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and you're welcome to stick around for our Pento Suite After Show, where we've got an unwrapping. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game Game on. on.